Well, hey there, everybody. My name is Brock, and I am thrilled that I get the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you unpacking some teaching from God and thankful that you've joined us today here at Heritage, whether you're in person or participating at Heritage Online. So whether I can see your face here in the audience or you can just see my face through your screen, I want to tell you that I am glad that you're here. But you hear that a lot, right? I mean, you hear a lot of different people that tell you, we're glad you're here, thanks for coming. If your experience is anything like mine, you hear that kind of language, that kind of sentiment everywhere you go these days. I mean, in lots of different environments, you might be sitting on an airplane and you've already struggled through all of the procedures to get on the plane and you've waited on the tarmac and you've been through all of the frustrations that go along with air travel and then you're listening as the flight attendant is reading a script that says, we know that you have options when you fly and we are really glad that you chose us. And you're thinking to yourself, are you? Or you might be walking into a fast food restaurant and you notice that all of the employees in the restaurant have been trained to blurt out every time the door opens, hi, welcome to generic burger place. In fact, they're so well-trained, they don't even have to look up from the work that they're doing. No eye contact involved whatsoever. And you kind of wonder, do they really know I'm here? You might be waiting on hold on a customer service line and you've been on hold and on hold and on hold and there's that elevator music playing, but every couple of seconds, there's a recorded voice that beeps in and what does it say? Your call is very important to us. I mean, it seems like everywhere you go, every which way you turn, there are people that are telling you, we're glad you're here. We're really excited to have you. Thank you for being a part of what we're doing. But sometimes, sometimes it's hard to tell if they mean it, right? You know, over the last couple of weeks, there have been a lot of families in our community and communities just like ours that have attended Meet the Teacher events. And then a couple of days later, they've sent the kiddos off to school. Some families have even made that nervous trip to drop off their young adult on a college campus or maybe you take them to basic training. And in all of those places, somebody said something like, welcome to this place. Welcome to our campus. Welcome to our school. Welcome." We're glad that you're here. And as parents, we're just hoping that those are more than empty words, aren't we? As parents, we are hoping that the people that greeted us at the door, met us in the parking lot, met us in the classroom, when they said, welcome, we're glad that you're here. We, as parents, are hoping that they meant it. We're hoping that those teachers and those instructors and those professors are going to see our kid as more than just a number on the roll sheet, right? We're hoping that they're going to notice and that they're going to care about what's going on in our kid's life and learning. And the reason that we're hoping that so desperately is because we know connection matters, right? Like we understand that it matters for somebody to have meaningful connections in the place where they're gonna spend such a significant amount of time. We know that a kid's self-esteem and their, their entire opinion about whether they even like school or they like learning, that's gonna be largely determined by the relationships that they form along the way. And so as parents, we are like itching for our kids, dying for our kids to have good friends and great teachers, but we recognize, and the, re I mean, the reason we're so excited about it is because we recognize that supportive peers and mentors make all the difference on the educational journey. And so does it seem strange? Does it seem strange to you that when it comes to the spiritual journey, sometimes we have a tendency to try to go it alone? Does it seem odd to you? Because it's so instinctive to us to understand about the educational journey and what our kids need. Does it seem odd to you that sometimes we have a tendency in the spiritual life to try to be independent? Last Sunday, we started discussing this spiritual isolation. And I said, when it comes to our own faith, and I'm talking about the marathon of walking with God through all of the stages of your life. When it comes to our own faith, too many people try to make that journey by themselves. 
And in this new series of messages here at Heritage, we are aiming to put a stop to spiritual seclusion among us. This is a series of messages that we've called Together, and it's founded on the conviction that you will never be your best self by yourself. It just can't possibly happen. That's not how you were designed. That's not how the world operates. You will never, ever be your best self, your best spiritual self, your best emotional self. You will never be your best self by yourself. Now, I'll be the first to say, every Christian needs some time alone. Every Christian needs some time to be with God and only with God. Every Christian needs time for solitude and reflection, but faith was meant to be practiced in community. It was meant to be practiced with people. In fact, the best way to gauge whether your faith is growing, the best way that you can tell if your faith is making any progress is to look at the way that your faith leads you to treat other people. The number one way that you can tell if your faith is making progress is to look at your relationships with the people around you. When the Apostle Paul said that the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of God's Spirit being involved in your life includes things like love and patience and kindness, he was pointing out that our connection to God is proven real in our relationships with people. He was saying every every time you notice yourself being more patient, every time you see yourself being kind when you didn't have to be, and you didn't get anything out of that, and that wasn't for you, every time you notice yourself displaying those kinds of character traits, goodness and kindness and patience and joy and self-control, every time that happens, it happens because something's happening between you and God, because you're growing in that way. In fact, last week we said that the vertical relationship that we have, the connection we have with our Creator, has a direct impact on the horizontal relationships that we have with each other. But this, this week I want to tell you that that cause and effect, that order of operations, that the vertical relationship impacts the horizontal relationship, it doesn't only work that one direction. In fact, When people follow Jesus together, when people go on this journey together, God uses that focus and that fellowship to build the faith of everybody involved. What I'm telling you is that when we engage in spiritually focused horizontal relationships, it can have a positive impact on our vertical relationship with God. Got it? In other words, the horizontal relationships have the potential to make the vertical relationship grow. You know, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts chapter 2, there's a compelling passage. It's really short, just a few verses. But it tells about the way that the very first Christians related to one another. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it describes this time period right after the Holy Spirit established the church in Jerusalem, just a few weeks after Jesus resurrected, rose from the dead. And when you read this description, you get the sense that these Christians in Jerusalem were like remarkably connected to each other. Here's what it says, starting in verse 42. It says, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. I mean, right off the bat, it sounds as if they are taking things very seriously. Like this was a commitment for these people, right? They're learning together. They're connecting with one another. They're eating together. They're praying together. And in the midst of all of that togetherness, they began to experience something together that felt supernatural. The next verse says, a sense of awe came over everyone. Now, what were they doing together? They were learning together. They were meeting together. They were eating and they were praying. I mean, it wasn't like rocket science, you know. It was pretty simple stuff. 
They were just being together, focused on spiritual things. But it says a sense of awe came over everyone and God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. And that seems to have inspired the people to grow even stronger in their connection with one another. It was like a cycle, a, a, something content, you know, it was building on itself. And in the next verse, verse 44, it says, all the believers were united and they shared everything. And they would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. And every day they met together in the temple and they ate in their homes and they shared food with gladness and simplicity. And they praised God and they demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. And the Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. Now, when I read this passage, it sounds inspiring, but it almost sounds like mythical to me. You know, it's like this golden age of church history when everybody was involved and everybody was fully committed and everybody gave their all. And so it's no wonder that the writer of Acts said, I need to write this down. It's no wonder that the writer of this book wanted to make sure that we could read about it later. He'd probably never, ever seen people get along that well before anywhere else, right? I mean, that just doesn't happen. But when you think about their particular context, this first church, these very first Christians in Jerusalem, they had a lot of cultural advantages that we don't. They had a lot of historical advantages in their community that made their connection with each other simpler. I mean, for one thing, everybody in Jerusalem lived within walking distance of each other, right? How many people in this room you think you live within walking distance of? It's not, I mean, you gotta walk a long way, right? You gotta keep walk and keep walking. Everybody in Jerusalem lived within probably a mile or two of each other because the city just wasn't that big from end to end. Everyone lived in close proximity to one another. They were gonna run into each other on a daily basis. There was nobody who was commuting to work. There was nobody who was going on long trips far from home on a regular basis. They lived close. They were in tight with each other. So they were gonna see each other anyway. But on top of all of that, you gotta remember, all the citizens of Israel were related to each other, right? They're like distant family. And there's a few people living in Jerusalem at that time who weren't Israelites, but not very many, which meant that just about everybody in town was your cousin's cousin's cousin, you know? Like you share history. You share a story and a narrative. You've got a background that's common to each other. And so when Acts chapter two says that the church gathered every single day and that they had everything in common, that they were so united and together, it's partly because of their situation just making things easy for them. And our situation's different, isn't it? Our situation's different. Here in North Fort Worth, there's almost nobody that's locally native to this area. I mean, I know there's a few of you who grew up in Keller, but 25 years ago, there were no houses within sight of this property right here. This was a cow pasture, right? Which meant that 25 years ago, nobody lived right here. Nobody lived in Heritage or Crawford Farms or any of these neighborhoods right here around us. 25 years ago, this was just empty fields with more longhorns on it. There weren't any houses near our campus, and so virtually every one of us has moved in here from somewhere else. And we've come from everywhere, haven't we? I mean, there's a few people here who, you know, traveled all the way from Saginaw or something like that, but then there's some people, then there's some people who grew up in different states people who grew up on different continents. There's people who grew up speaking different languages who are represented today here in this church gathering. I mean, we've come from everywhere and we've got different backgrounds and different experiences and different points of view. And here we are. We found ourselves here in North Texas. But here, here's a big place, isn't it? I mean, just because you found yourself in North Texas doesn't mean that we all are from the same place now. I mean, every week, and even this morning, there's people here in this room who live in Tarrant County, people who live in Wise County, people who live in Parker County, people who live in Denton County. We got people that are stretched all over the place that drove in long distances to be here together this morning, maybe even further. Some of us live more than an hour's drive at highway speeds away from each other, and that's not even considering the folks who are in our online campus today. 
Some of our most faithful viewers in our online campus live in places like Pennsylvania and New York State, you know? I mean, it's a long distance between us, thousands of miles in some cases. And what I'm saying is we are a scattered and diverse church family. We don't have the convenience of the natural connection that the earliest Christians did in Jerusalem. But I'm convinced. I'm convinced that despite the challenges, despite our differences and our diversity, I'm convinced that God has designed us and placed us here for a community connection that's similar to what those early Christians experienced. I believe that God used the horizontal relationships between those Christians in Jerusalem all those years ago to build each individual's vertical faith. In fact, I believe that that's frequently the way God works and the way faith grows. But here's the thing. It doesn't just happen, does it? It doesn't just happen because of our diversity and because of the distance between us, life-changing community for us requires more attention. We've got to work harder. We've got to be more purposeful. It's more challenging for us, but I believe that it presents more potential for something beautiful. The secret is that we've got to choose to live into the connections that God has prepared for us. Now, in last week's sermon, we looked at a passage together in Romans chapter 12. Romans, the sixth book of the New Testament portion of your Bible. And in that passage, Paul compared the church to a body with all of its various parts and all of its functions. And I mentioned last week that there's another passage later in the New Testament where Paul fleshes out that metaphor even more, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you've got a Bible with you, I would love for you to turn it on or open it up. I'll put these verses up here on the screen too, but you can follow along in your own Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you need to know that Paul wrote this letter that's what 1 Corinthians is. It's a letter. And he wrote it to Christian people who lived in the city of Corinth, which is in Greece. Okay? And the fascinating part for us is that even though this all happened almost 2,000 years ago, Corinth is a lot like Fort Worth. Corinth has a lot in common with our city. In fact, Corinth was very little like Jerusalem and much more like the city that we all know as home. Corinth was a port city in Greece, and, but it was unique because it was on this narrow strip of land, the Isthmus, I think, I think my geography teachers would be proud of me for remembering that, right? It's on this narrow strip of land between two big bodies of water, which means Corinth has a harbor on both sides of town. Okay, And in order to avoid a long sailing voyage through treacherous waters, merchants would bring their ships full of cargo to one harbor and they would unload everything and carry it across land two or three miles to the other harbor and load it on a new ship to keep on going on its journey, right? And so Corinth is this busy trade route location and it's constantly got people that are coming and going and cargo that's showing up from all over the world. Some of it's, you know, regular old, you know, just dry goods and some of it's like animals and that kind of stuff. It's a commercial hub where there's constantly sailors and caravans and traders who are moving in and out. It's a diverse city. There's lots of Greek people. There's lots of Roman people. There's lots of Jewish people. There's lots of African people. There's lots of people from all over the world who have found their way to Corinth. No, hardly anybody was a native there, right? We're talking about a similar location to this. The people who were in Corinth came from everywhere. It was just as diverse a city as Fort Worth is today because everybody had migrated in from someplace else. And the same was true of the little church that had gotten started there. This little group of Christians in Corinth, they were as diverse as the city around them, and so they faced some struggles, as you can probably imagine. They had some conflict. 
They had some controversy in their church. They did not always naturally see things eye to eye because they had different background, different point of view, different experiences, different opinions. But Paul, boy, Paul was optimistic. Paul had such high hopes for these people in this little church in Corinth. He had high hopes for them because he believed, don't miss this, he believed that their differences were actually part of the beautiful story God was writing. He believed that their diversity was their strength. He believed that their diversity presented an opportunity for God's spirit to do something miraculous, something supernatural, something that no human group of people could possibly do on their own. And so in his letter, Paul starts to elaborate on this idea about the church being a body. And you've got to understand that when Paul's letter was read to the people in Corinth for the first time and probably translated into multiple letters, languages because of how diverse the group was. When this letter was read to the Christians in Corinth for the first time, they probably rolled their eyes. They probably said, oh, that Paul, he doesn't really get it. He doesn't really understand how things work. I'm not sure I want to sign up for the kind of journey that Paul is prescribing here. That's probably what they were thinking because they were so different. They were so distinct from one another. They, they wouldn't have seen an opportunity or a realistic chance of connectedness between them. But, but Paul saw what was possible because of Jesus. Paul could envision what was only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's what he says, beginning in chapter 12, verse 12. He says, Christ or Jesus is just like the human body. Now, this is where he's getting into that metaphor we talked about. He says, a body is a single unit, right? I mean, you only have one, but your body is made up of many parts, he says. And all of the parts of the body, they collectively form one, right? They collectively form one body, even though they are many. And you can understand he also meant even though they are so different, all the parts of the body so different from one another. And yet when they're brought together and then pieced together in just the right way, they create one cohesive unit. And so Paul says, this is what's happened to you. This is what's happened to us. Verse 13, he says, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether we were Jew or Greek. Whether we were slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. Paul is saying we have all been assembled with all of our differences and all of our diversity and all of our different backgrounds and history and all of that. We've all been assembled by one God into one body. He says we come from different places. We've got different perspectives. We come from different generations here in our family, right? We've got so much different. There's plenty of reason for us to look around and think, I don't have very much in common with many of the people who are in this group. But part of the miracle of Christ, part of what Paul is trying to point out and cast this vision about is to say, when we accepted Jesus, when we were baptized into Christ, even though we came from every corner of the globe, we are one. We became family. We were united by the Spirit of God. And all of the differences that are between us, they don't go away. They come together to form something beautiful, one body. He goes on a few verses later, chapter 12, verse 18. He says, God has placed each one of the parts in the body just like he wanted. Y'all stop there for just a second. Think about what that means. Think about what it means for one of the first missionaries, one of the first Christian ministers who could see what God was up to. Think about what it means for that person to look at a church just as diverse as this one and to say, God put you here on purpose. God placed you here for a reason 
This is not a mistake. God placed each one of the parts of the body just like he wanted. And then Paul asks these rhetorical questions. He, he says, if we were all one in the same body part, if we were all just homogenous, if we all looked the same, dressed the same, talked the same, acted the same, thought the same, and felt the same, if we were all just one in the same body part, he says, what would happen to the body? Well, that's a, a silly question, isn't it? As it is, though, he says, there are many parts but one body. You see, Paul is celebrating the diversity of the church, and not just because he thinks it's neat. It's not just because he thinks it's novel. It's not just because he thinks it's fascinating. Paul says, God did this on purpose. Using this body metaphor, Paul says, God was building something intentionally when God put the church together. And a body demands diversity, doesn't it? I mean, think what it would be like if you had two right hands. I don't know how that would work, but it would sure be weird to not have two hands that were mirror images of each other, right? A body demands diversity. The hands need the heart, the legs need the feet, Paul says diversity in the church is not a glitch. It's a feature that God built in. And the beauty of God's plan shows up in the next couple of verses that we're going to read. You see, in the natural world, in the surrounding world that we can see with our eyes, diversity usually leads to division, doesn't it? In the natural world, diversity leads to division because of differences. That's what we are naturally inclined to do. But spiritually, we are invited to do something else. In the spiritual world of the church, God uses diversity to knit people together. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 24. He says, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts with less honor so that there won't be any division. This is God's plan for there to not be any division in the body. And so the parts might have mutual concern for each other, mutual concern. Y'all realize there's like a whole nother half of our church family that meets in here at 1030. Some of y'all never met. Some of them have never met you. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying like having mutual concern for one another. Are you interested? Has the spirit led you to be interested in who they are and what they need and what they're like? Has the Spirit led you and called you and drawn you to be somebody who has mutual concern for the other people in your church family? Paul goes on in verse 26. He says, in God's family, in the spiritual realm of the church, if one part suffers, all of the parts suffer with it. You remember the last time you slammed your hand in a door and your entire body reacted because all of the parts of your body were suffering with your hand that was actually injured. He says, that's how it is in the church. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part gets the glory, all the parts celebrate with it. If one part's going through a great time, everybody celebrates that joyous moment together. And if, if one part's going through grief, we're there with them. Verse 27, he says, you are the body of Christ. You are follower of Jesus placed wherever you are. You've, you've somehow shown up here in North Texas. You've somehow shown up in this community from somewhere else, most likely. And you, follower of Jesus, placed here by God's divine providence, you are the body of Christ and you are parts of each other. Paul's serious about this. I mean, Christian community is a top priority for him, but he's not naive about it. He's not naive about the challenges that this is going to bring up. He realizes that the world, our natural world, is set up to accentuate our differences and to foster division. But Paul's casting this big vision about what God's up to. 
Paul's casting this big vision about what God can do, and he's charting a course for the church to follow. And what he's telling us is that as followers of Jesus, if you want to grow in your faith, you have to grow together. This is something that we don't do on our own because our relationships with each other, they help grow the relationship with God. The horizontal relationships and the connections and the support and the faith that we grow in together helps us to build our individual vertical relationship and faithfulness to God. And I don't have to tell you, this is not going to be easy. You already know. You already know that relationships that have that much connection, that have that much influence on each other, that have that much real life shared it's not gonna be easy, is it? I know. It's been said over and over again. Preachers have said it. Politicians have said it. News, you know, news broadcasters have said it. Editors have said it. Everybody says that the world has never been as divided as it is today. I don't know if that's true or not. But I do know we live in a cultural moment not unlike the one that the Christians in Corinth lived in. We live in a cultural moment where our surrounding community doesn't foster unity for us. Our surrounding community and our human condition do not incline us to care deeply for one another. Oh, we can care on a surface level. Sometimes I feel real good about myself because I'll be stuck in traffic going up the hill on Heritage Trace Parkway here up, up to the stoplight, and there's people over there by Chipotle waiting to turn in from the side street, and I'll let one in because I care. I mean, we know how to care for one another, right? But I'm talking about real caring. I'm talking about the kind of caring that makes a difference. I'm talking about the kind of caring that surprises people, that shocks people. In fact, I'm talking about the kind of caring that would shock you if you did it. The kind of caring for somebody else that would make you think, whoa, why do I care about them this much? What did I just do? And you'll say, that had to be God. That's the kind of caring I'm talking about. We don't live in a community that fosters that kind of caring. We don't live in a, in a setting that fosters that kind of unity. And so we, if we are going to experience the kind of paradigm-shifting, life-changing, faith-building community connections that God has in store for us, we have to go against the flow, don't we? We have to resist the divisions that normally push people apart in human communities. If we're going to experience the kind of paradigm shifting, life changing, faith building connections that God has written into his plan for us, we have to purposefully, intentionally draw together so that God can do a unifying work in us. It sounds really challenging. It sounds really complicated. It sounds like it's not going to be easy, and you're right. But I do have good news. The recipe is simple. Let me remind you. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. I mean, it's a four-ingredient recipe. Pretty simple stuff, really. Just get these four things together and mix them up. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the community, to their shared meals, and to prayers. It sounds like what they did was they decided none of us are going to go on this spiritual journey alone. 
we're going to go together. When it comes to learning about what God would have us do, I mean, yeah, go have a quiet time. Go do that. Go be alone with God. Go be in solitude and silence with God. I'll preach another sermon about those very important topics at some other day. But don't do this whole thing alone. Be together. We got to be together and we got to share what we're learning and we got to share what we're hearing. And the reality is that when we read the scripture or when we pray and listen for the spirit, we hear something that's a little bit different than our neighbor does because of our own experience and our own lens and our own point of view. And we got to learn from each other. So they devoted themselves to listening to what God was telling the church through the apostles at that time. And they devoted themselves to the community. They shared life with each other. They decided we're not going to be the kind of people who just are on this Jesus journey by ourselves. We're going to devote ourselves to the community. And then, this is my favorite part, they shared meals together. They ate together. And you know that's not just utilitarian. You know that's something bigger than just meeting your daily needs, right? Because here's the thing. When I eat together with somebody who has a totally different background than me. When I eat together and share meal together and share hospitality together and share laughter together with somebody who has a totally different experience, maybe it's a totally different ethnicity or totally different skin color or totally different native language or a totally different background. When I share table with somebody like that, people around us say, what, what drew them together? What made that possible? And we say, God did this. God did this. God made this possible. God created this beautiful connection, this beautiful relationship. And it says the early church devoted themselves to their prayers. They prayed together. Y'all, there's a lot of different ways we could make this happen. There's a lot of different ways that we could try to jumpstart this as a church. But I'm here to tell you, we've got a structure that's already in place here at Heritage that gives us each the opportunity to participate in our devotion to learning together, being in sharing life together, sharing meals together, and praying together. We call it our small groups ministry. And it's the time of year right now. This is the time of year that we really love to encourage people to take seriously this invitation, this commitment to connect with one another in groups. But here's the deal. We're not, we're not just doing this. We're not just assigning people into these groups so that we can, you know, continue to filter out information to more, more, you know, of our membership. We're, we're doing this because this is what the church does. We're doing this because it helps to make sure that big church doesn't get too big for you to feel included. We're doing this because it makes big church feel small. We're doing this because somebody needs to know you. Somebody needs to know your story. Somebody needs to know your kids. Somebody needs to know where you live. Somebody needs to know your dog's name, where you work. Somebody needs to know when you go missing. Somebody needs to know what's going on in your life. And you need to know those people too. You need it. You need it. Y'all, some of you, this is the first time you've ever been at Heritage during small groups relaunch season. And you're thinking, that sounds pretty good. I'd like to try that. And I'm going to give you some instructions on how to do it. Some of you are hearing this for about the 18th time. And maybe you've tried it in the past or maybe you haven't. But I'm here to tell you, this is not a church program. This is a God program. This is what God is up to. This is just, this is just human, you know, structure put on what God is trying to do, where God is drawing us together to focus on learning and community and sharing meals and praying together. This is what God wants us to do to grow in faith. And so I want to challenge you today. I want to invite you. In the next couple of weeks, we're doing signups and launch for multiple small groups. Some of these are existing groups that have room for new members. Some of these are going to be new groups that are going to be coming together and forming. Some of these groups are going to meet in person. Some of them are going to meet online. Some of these groups are going to meet on Sundays, and some of them are going to meet at other times of the week that work for the members of that group. But I want you to be a part. And so I'm going to show you two quick 
silent videos. One of them is going to show you how to use the smartphone app on your phone, the Heritage app, to, to go and find out how to sign up for small groups. So we're going to launch that video. Just let it play while I'm talking here. The second video, this will show you where to click so that you can go and get the information that you need. Sign up and send us your info and tell us, I want to be a part. The second video is going to show you how to do it on our website. You can go to the website and click on next steps and scroll down and see where it says small groups. And you get all the same opportunities on the website that you did on the smartphone app. But I want you to be a part of this. I want you to be a part of this, not for me and not for heritage as an organization. I want you to be a part of this because your faith in God will grow when you go on the spiritual journey together. Your faith in God will be stronger when you go on a spiritual journey in community. I want this for you. And God wants this for you. And the reality is that God, God has already proven, God has already demonstrated, and God has already promised that God would go to any length necessary to connect with you. In fact, in the last waning moments of our service together this morning, we're going to remind each other of the great length to which God has gone to reconnect with us. See, God wants that vertical relationship to be so strong. God wants that connection with you so badly. God loves you so much. God loves the world so much that God was willing to give it all.